Page 97, right, the section entitled Right and Wrong. The tenth step tells us that we have to promptly admit when we're wrong. The step, the step seems to assume that we know when we're wrong, but the fact is that most of us don't, at least not right away. It takes the consistent practice of taking a personal inventory for us to become proficient at figuring out when we're wrong. Let's face it, when we were new in recovery, we had been at odds with the rest of the world for some time. As the basic text says, our living skills were reduced to the animal level. We didn't know how to communicate with others well. We began to learn in recovery, but in the process we made a lot of mistakes. Many of us went through a period of time when we became very rigid about the values we had developed in recovery. We applied that rigidity not only to ourselves, but to everyone around us. We thought it was principled and correct to confront those whose behavior was unacceptable. In truth, it was our behavior that was unacceptable. We were self-righteous and overbearing. We were wrong. Or some of us, for, after years of serving as a doormat for everyone to walk across, decided our recovery required to become assertive. We went too far. We demanded that everyone treat us perfectly all the time. No one could have a bad day and fail to return our phone call. No one was allowed to be emotionally unavailable for us for any length of time. We angrily demanded perfect service at the places we did business. We weren't being assertive. We were being immature and belligerent. We were wrong. We can even end up being wrong if someone hurts us. How? Say our sponsor says something very hurtful to us. Instead of taking up it up with our sponsor, we talk to 10 or 12 of our closest friends at the next three meetings we go to. Before the week is through, half our local NA community is talking about the rotten things so-and-so said to one of his sponsees. And that's if the story stayed as it was originally. So the situation started out with us having done no wrong, but ended up with us being responsible for damaging our sponsor's reputation in the program, the place where he needs, as much as we do, to be allowed to make mistakes and recover at his own pace. Questions. Have there been some times in my recovery when I've been wrong and not been aware of it until later? What were they? How do my wrongs affect my own life? others lives it's hard enough to figure out when we're wrong admitting our wrongs can't be can even be more challenging just like in the ninth step we have to be careful that we aren't weren't doing more damage by making the admission page 98 for instance many of us realize when we, many of us realize we've hurt someone close to us perhaps because the person stopped speaking to us but aren't quite sure what we said or did wrong Rather than taking the time to reflect on what might have, we might have done or ask the person, we decide we'll just cover all the eventualities and make a blanket admission. We approach the person and say, please forgive me for anything I've ever, in all the time we've known each other, done to offend you or hurt you. The tenth step requires that we take the time for personal reflection, for instances just like this. Chances are that if we think about when the person's attitude changed toward us and think about our behavior immediately preceding that change, we'll know what we did wrong. It might be painful or embarrassing to think about. It definitely takes effort, but so do all the steps. Laziness is a character defect like any other, and we can't afford to act on it. Then again, if we're truly stumped, if we just can't pinpoint anything we might have said or done that was harmful, there's nothing wrong with approaching the person and saying we've noticed that he or she seems to be angry or upset with us, that we care about our relationship with that person and want to hear what he or she has to say. Most of us are afraid of what we'll hear in a situation like this, but we can't let our fears stop us from working step 10. There's another way we can render our admission of wrong completely ineffective. Admit we're wrong and then immediately point out what the other person did first that made us act as we did. For instance, say one of our children used poor manners, so we yelled at her and called her a name. Now when we admit we were wrong, if we tell our child that her behavior made us act the way we did, we just delivered a message that justified our first wrong, thus making ourselves doubly wrong. Unlike the process contained in steps 4 through 9, when we go through events from the past, step 10 is designed to keep us current. We don't want to let unresolved wrongs pile up. We need to try our very best to stay abreast of what we're doing. Most of our work will be done by making constant adjustments to our outlook. If we find ourselves becoming negative and complaining all the time, we might want to spend some time thinking about the things for which we are grateful. We may need to pay attention. We need to pay attention to the way we react when we've done something wrong. Is it our first impulse to make an excuse? Are we claiming to be victims of someone's negative influence or of our dis disease? All excuses aside, we are responsible for what we do. It may very well be that our character defects get the better of us, but that doesn't excuse our behavior.
We need to accept responsibility and continue to be willing to have our shortcomings removed. Questions. When we were wrong, promptly admitted it. What does this mean to me? Have there been times in my recovery when I've made situations worse by talking to someone before I should have or blaming my behavior on someone else? What were they? How does promptly admitting my wrongs help me change my behavior? Page 99. Step 10 points out the need to continue taking personal inventory and seems to assert that we do this solely to find out when we're wrong. But how can we identify the times we're wrong unless we have times we're right as a basis for comparison? Identifying the times we do things right and forming personal values are as much a part of personal inventory as identifying our liabilities. Most of us have a very difficult time with the concept of being right. We think of the times we vigorously defended an opinion because, because we just knew we were right, but in light of our recovery, we've come to understand that trampling over others in discussion makes us wrong. Or we think of our of our personal values. We know they're right for us, but if we begin insisting that others live them, we would no longer be right, but self-righteous. So how do we get comfortable with being right? First and foremost, by working the sixth and the seventh steps so that our character defects don't turn our positive acts into negative ones. Then we have to realize that it will probably take some time and some trial and error before we com are completely comfortable in our new lives in recovery. Question, have there been situations in my recovery in which I felt uncomfortable about acknowledging something I had done well? Describe. Next section entitled, How Often Should We Take Personal Inventory? It Works How and Why tells us that while our goal is to maintain continuous awareness of ourselves throughout each day, it's very helpful to sit down at the end of each day and work this step. We need the consistency of doing something every day for it to become a habit and to internalize the spiritual principles of the activity. As we stay clean in our days of continuous abstinence, turn into weeks and months and years, we'll find that taking a personal inventory has become second nature. We'll find that keeping track of our spiritual fitness comes naturally without our having to think too much about it. We'll notice right away when we're headed in a direction we don't want to go or about to engage in a behavior that's sure to cause harm we become able to correct it. So the frequency of our formal efforts to take personal inventory may depend on our experience with recovery. In the beginning, some of us sat down at the beginning of our day, at the end of our day, or even both times and went through IP9, living the program, or something similar, and took our spiritual temperature. The point is that we want to keep at it until it becomes a habit, until it's second nature, to continuously monitor our recovery and our spiritual state Notice when we're going off course right away and work to change it. Question, why is it important to continue to take personal inventory until it becomes second nature?